I think that might have been record time to get everything set up. Um, I'm going to start for a moment with stuff in the news and, and then get into uh, the topic we've been talking about for several weeks now. So, so two things from the news this week that I, I think uh, we're all probably thinking a, a, a fair bit about. Uh, one of them, the death of Alexei Navalny, the great Russian dissident uh, in a Russian labor camp, uh, apparently two days ago. And, and um, we don't know all the details, but I think irrespective of the exact cause of death, and, and, and I think we, we, we certainly shouldn't conclude that it's a, a, a natural cause of death. I think there, there, there are good reasons to suspect foul play given his age, given his relatively robust appearance in, in, in quite recent video uh, taken of him as, as he appeared in, before judges, et cetera. It, it appears that foul play is at least a, a plausible explanation. But but pulling back from, from what we can't know yet, what well, does appear to be the case is that what this leader of opposition to Vladimir Putin's autocracy is now dead. Um, that he is dead in part because his courage, his leadership, his devotion to his people and his cause, what he called the beautiful future of Russia, led him to return to Russia as he explained it to his wife and children in order not to advocate on behalf of the Russian people without suffering what the Russian people are suffering. That if he was going to be a true leader, he had to be in the country and in harm's way. And, and, and he paid for his courage, his commitment, his principles with his life. And, and I will point out in a moment some connections with American domestic politics, but I, I, I want to just start with the most general thought about this, which, which is that this is the, 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 the most inspiring kind of human courage. And, and, and we see this, we, we, we remember these individuals, we remember the George Washingtons, the Mahatma Gandhi's, the Martin Luther King Jr.'s, the Nelson Mandela's of the world, because they put themselves in harm's way to fight for the freedom of their people against the odds, right? And, 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 and they show a, a courage that the vast majority of us do not possess. And in a sense, we are fortunate in the United States in the 21st century, that we don't need to possess that courage, that our government won't, for the most part, put us in jail because of our dissidents, that, that our legal system protects our fundamental individual rights. But I, I think we also need to recognize how precious those protections are. And at the same time, that they cannot be taken for granted, that they are fragile, that they are vulnerable, that Russia moved from being more open to again being more authoritarian, more autocratic, more dangerous for individuals who dissent from what the government wants them to do and believe, and that this is happening throughout the world and that this is a threat here too. And we have to be as clear as possible in ways that we will discuss further today. Democracy is not working very well in the United States. It has its defects. It is no longer <coughs> clearly serving the fundamental interests of many of the people of the United States. But the question we face, the juncture we're at is, do we reject democracy? Do we try a different system of government? And, and part of the reason I begin with the, the brutal political murders in Russia is to, to point to what the alternative is. And, and, and so we, we should not lose perspective 
yes, we are disappointed with how democracy is dysfunctioning in America in the 21st century. But what that means is that we need to work to fix democracy, not that we need as apparently large numbers of our fellow citizens are to lose faith in the project altogether and to consider alternatives that are much less secure in terms of their capacity to protect individual rights that in a sense give up on the project of constitutional representative pluralist democracy as no longer relevant to the 21st century. I will add very quickly that, that part of the reason to suspect some uh, further foul play, right? And, and, and to be as clear as possible, Navani should not have been in jail to begin with, right? He, he's there on trumped up charges because he is a thorn in the side of Vladimir Putin's regime because he is more popular and able to articulate the dissent and discontent that are felt by so many Russians because he explicitly and clearly condemns the invasion of the Ukraine and says out loud that Russia will owe reparations to the Ukrainians for their illegal campaign of conquest. That's why he's in jail. That's why he's dead. And, and having said that, I think that we then need to, to recognize that part of what emboldened Putin is the fact that Russia is slowly advancing. They had a, a, an important victory, uh, tactical, not, not a big victory, but, but claiming a town that they had been fighting for for a couple years and at huge sacrifice over the last couple of days, right? And the Ukrainians are retreating in part because... They don't have sufficient ammunition to hold grounds. And that's in part because of domestic politics in the United States. And it looks, I think, from Putin's vantage, increasingly likely that the United States will no longer be a reliable ally of Ukraine, of NATO, of its uh, partners in the world in containing Russian aggression, and that this likely emboldened Putin. The idea that even if Donald Trump doesn't win, the paralysis in our legislature prevents us from pursuing a mature, sober foreign policy, I think think is, is, is part of the calculus here. And then, of course, there's a lot of reason for Vladimir Putin to hope that Donald Trump will win and that when he wins, Americans, America's foreign policy will continue to become more isolationist, that Donald Trump's personal admiration for strong men in general and Putin in particular will continue to redirect American foreign policy in a way that is advantageous for him. And, 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 and so I just think we have to be... Um, clear-eyed about the connection between the way in which we seem to be retreating from our commitment to the Ukraine, to NATO, our incapacity to act on the stated policy of our foreign affairs. This is being read by dictators like Putin as a green light to, to, to go after their dissidents, their opposition, their neighbors. And, and so we need to be as lucid as possible about the consequences of the partisan games, the way in which Madison puts it, the low arts by which elections are won. They are on clear display in Congress right now in, in, in terms of, you know, coupling aid to the Ukraine with some sort of immigration policy, hammering out an immigration reform bill and then torpedoing it at the last moment. And, and, and so this is all of a piece, all of a kind. The second big piece of news is that Donald Trump got hit with a major verdict yesterday, that he had engaged in fraud, that the fraud had benefited his Trump enterprises to the tune of over $350 million, that he has to repay that ill-gotten gain, gain that was produced via the fraud to the state of New York, and 
in addition, pay interest on it. The total is $450 million that he will be barred from doing in business in New York for several years, that his sons will also be fined and barred from doing business, and that a court-appointed monitor will continue to supervise the Trump Corporation to make sure that this kind of fraud does not persist. And, and uh, let me get out of the slides real quick. Um, I, I would just point out to you very quickly that that it seems to me the relevance of, of this, uh, it, you know, and, and, and I will confess to, to not liking Donald Trump very much and to uh, sometimes uh, being happy when bad things happen to people I don't <laughs> That's not my better nature, but it is human nature. I I, I try to restrain that, but I, I I don't want to dwell on Trump's misfortune just because it's Trump's misfortune. I want to ask, what are the broader political ramifications of the fact that this verdict comes very quickly on the heels of a verdict in a defamation case in which it was found that um, Trump first of all, sexually harassed E.J. and Carroll, and then lied about it, and then repeatedly lied about it in ways that damaged her. Um, and and I, I think there, there are multiple issues here. I mean, one, one of them is whether, in fact, Trump has the money on hand to actually pay all of this. And if he doesn't, what it does to his reputation as a successful business person. But I think much more important and, and I'm, I'm beginning to think of, of the 2024 election in the following terms. I'm, I'm, I'm building on stuff that I'm reading and thinking about, um, that we have two flawed candidates for a change, that, that we have two candidates where I think we're going to be trying to decide whether the liabilities of the one outweigh the liabilities of the other. And, and the, the liabilities of Joe Biden He's old. We talked about this last week. I'm, I'm not convinced that that is per se a liability. I hope that is obvious. But he is also widely perceived to be ineffective. And, and I think that's the best way to read the issue of age is that we want someone energetic in the presidency because we fear that this office is already so hamstrung that it can't get much done. Maybe that's part of the reason there's an attraction to a rule breaker as well, which is if you play by the rules, you're going to be ineffective. Now, I, I wanna be as clear as possible. I, I think by one metric, Joe Biden is not an ineffective president. And that metric is legislative accomplishment over the course of four years. He is, probably as effective as any president has been in the last 40 years measured in that way. But by another measure, how much do the policies passed during a four-year term of a president change the actual lived reality of the lives of people in our society? probably every president for the last 40 years is regarded as reasonably ineffective by most Americans. And 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 so Trump Trump is, is is painting Biden as old and therefore as ineffective. And this plays into the sense that American government just doesn't work for the American people very well anymore. And we need someone who is more energetic, someone who is more willing to bend the rules or break the rules to do the things that can't be done within the rules. I, th I think we have to, in some sense, respect the fact that this is the judgment of many people in our society. How do we weigh that against the liabilities of Donald Trump? And here, I think what's happened yesterday and over the last few weeks help us, us to see that this is a man who lies without any compunction or remorse, does so in order to benefit himself and not just to benefit himself, but to absolutely maximize the benefit to himself. It's the 
not as if he wouldn't have got the loans he took had he been honest in his accounting, had he not doubled the size of his apartment, had he not indicated that Mar-a-Lago was held in a way that it isn't held, that, that, that he's a brash liar, that he lies about things that are obvious, and, and that he does so in order to benefit himself, and that he shows no remorse, no compunction, that he is, and then we can turn to the E.J. and Carroll case, um, in, in basic respects, predatory in, in the way he treats people who he doesn't like or feels that he can take advantage of, that he is willing to use the power he possesses to maximize his own advantage and to victimize those who he doesn't like or he sees some advantage to be taken over, right? And, and I think when we measure those liabilities. There, there's something that came in my inbox from the New York Times today. I haven't had a chance to look at it. Are there any persuadable voters left in the United States is, is, is the title of the thread. And there are very few, right? I mean, I don't think the people in this room probably need to uh, spend a lot of time with that scale. Are the liabilities of Joe Biden worse than the liabilities of Donald Trump? But I think we have to hope that the people who are actually going to decide this election are looking at these verdicts and saying to themselves, ah, yes, that, that's what the Trump presidency was like. This is what this man is like. What would another four years of this man be like? And, and, and please note that he has indicated, and there's every reason to believe, that he would be much less restrained in the next term as president than he was in the previous term. And, and so those are the things that are on my mind about this week's news. I'll pause for a second. Anybody want to come on, on either of those issues before we jump back into thinking about inequality and how it's being produced and what we can do about it in the contemporary American economy? Let me jump into the topic then. Um, so two seconds. I have I have some uh, different art today. I um, looked for an Orozco uh, mural from Mexico City, from the Colegio del Il Defenso uh, in Mexico City of uh, law and justice. And, and, and part of what I'm transitioning to here, as you can see, right, law and justice, drunkenly dancing together, obviously not what they should be. And this is an indication, I think, in Orozco's view of what grave inequality does to law and justice, how deeply they pervert them. And I, I've tried to make the argument with you, I will continue <clears throat> making that argument today, that there are economic forces in the form of capitalism we have in the 21st century. And, and, and one way to refer to this is liberal meritocratic capitalism. Another way to refer to it is neoliberal. Another way to refer to it is globalized, financialized, information-based capitalism. But you know, one thing to recognize is that the kind of capitalism we have in the 21st century is different from the kind of capitalism we had in the middle of the 20th century, which might be referred to as social democratic capitalism. That social democratic capitalism was bounded, was constrained in ways that prevented its intrinsic tendency to produce inequality from being fully manifested, that actually produced a kind of market outcome that was good for everyone and especially for the least well off. And that in the 21st century, we no longer have that kind of capitalism. And, and I'm not suggesting that we can get back to where we were in the middle of the 20th century. I don't think the policies that worked in an industrial form of capitalism will work for a post-industrial globalized financialized form of capitalism, but that we have to recognize the intrinsic tendency of this kind of capitalism to produce inequality 
as it produces wealth. And, and I've spoken with you about Thomas Piketty. I've spoken with you about the work of Franco Milanovic and, and, and the growing body of economic literature, highly researched, highly sophisticated, deeply rooted in data and historical analysis that says, look, you don't get wealth creation at the societal level in the 21st century without getting greater inequality. And, and my suggestion is that this is something we should be talking about. This is something that we should be focused on as we approach an election year. We have become again a much more unequal society. The inequality seems to be driving desperation on the part of a substantial share of our workforce, on a substantial share of our population. That is driving up deaths of despair. That is driving down life expectancy in the United States. That seems to me to be the most concrete, the most visceral way of measuring whether our economy is working for us or not. And I think we, we should conclude that as we enter the second quarter of the 21st century, we need to change the metric with which we evaluate our economy. We need to change the goals of our economic policy. We need to get over the fetish of growth, of the stock market, of job creation, of macroeconomic data-driven evaluations of economic health if they don't translate into the well-being of the average people in our society, if we're getting richer, but also getting worse off as a result. And I think the evidence is pretty clear that that is what is happening. We need to start thinking about what kind of economy would actually increase our well-being, our security, our ability to get along with each other, our capacity to work together politically to accomplish our main ends. And we don't have that kind of economy in the 21st century. Because we skipped last week, I'll, I'll review very briefly, not the, the, the kind of complex economics of Piketty and Milanovic that support these conclusions, but just that the evidence that we see all around us, right? Our economy has become much less fair. It used to be increases in productivity, which drive increases in profitability, also drove increases in earnings and so household income. That stopped being the case in the 1970s and has basically completely come apart in the current century, so that average hourly earnings are stagnant while productivity continues to improve. The result of this is not just that household income is stagnant and people are working more and more hours to maintain their standard of living. It's also that the uh, rate of income growth keeps going down, the rate of inequality keeps going up, and perhaps most illuminating, the labor share, the amount of wealth created that goes to the workers, the people who depend on wages in our society keeps decreasing, right? Being steadily driven down over the last 75 years. This is a sign of the decline of unions. This is a sign of increased global wage competition. This is a sign of taxations being more regressive as opposed to progressive. It's also a sign of a culture shift. It's, it's a sign of a society that cares less about equality, less about fairness, more about profit. And, and, and I'm going to get into the cultural dimensions of this, but I, I hope this much is clear. And again, just to summarize these results, if we compare the period of social democratic capitalism from the 1940s to the 1980s in the United States with the period of um, neoliberal 
or liberal meritocratic capitalism from 1980 to 2019, we can see a sharp difference. In the earlier period, those who were least well off benefited the most from economic growth, right? And, and those who were better off from them were still benefiting. This was roughly even, but this was a economy that lifted the bottom, that had a bottom-up pattern of economic growth. Um, from the 1980s to the present, as you can see, this diagram is twice as wide as it would otherwise need to be to accommodate the income growth of the top 0.001%, right? And look at the infinitesimally small share over the course of a 40 year period of the bottom 10% in terms of the amount of income growth that they've seen. And again, right, it, it, it's skewed all the way down, top skewed all the way down. The result is of course that we've become a much more unequal society and that the differences between us economically have now become chasms of inequality. And, and so this then drives our economic mobility down. And, and this is, uh, I hope, reasonably straightforward. But when, on the one hand, there are greater distances, as you see here, sorry, between the bottom 20% and the next 20% up, it's harder to move from the bottom 20% to the next 20%. The, the rungs on the ladder are further apart. And we see this reflected in the fact that the United States has become one of the least upwardly mobile societies in the developed world. The society with the most elasticity, I'm sorry, the least elasticity, the most inelasticity in our incomes across generations. So right, the, the, if your children, if, if you're in the bottom 20% and you have children, there's a 43% chance that they will too be in the bottom 20%, uh, a negligible chance that they're actually gonna rise to the top. If you're born in the top, a very high chance that your children will remain in the top, a very low chance that they will tumble down. This makes us um, among the least mobile societies in the world today. And what this diagram shows, I, I, I hope it is clear, is that if you correlate inequality with mobility, the relationship is very clear. The more equal the society, the easier it is for people to move up and down the income ladder across generations. The more unequal, the more difficult. I've already talked about one explanation for this, which is simply that the differences are greater, so it's hard to move up. But there's a second explanation that I think is extremely important, which is in a more unequal society, moving down the income ladder, right? And go back to this diagram for a second. If you're right in the top 20%, if your children were, were to, fall down just one quintile, right? Just to the next 20%, they would literally have less than half of your income, right? And, and you would be worried. They, they would not be able to afford the standard of living that they've grown accustomed to and that you want for them. And therefore, you invest more in maintaining your standard of living and in transmitting the privilege that generates it to your children. And this is a, a, a very robust finding. The more unequal the society, the more the wealthy parents concentrate on securing advantages for their children, investing in their children to purchase those advantages for them and then also um, doing everything they can 
to pass their wealth down to their children. And, and so one way of understanding this is by looking at how much parents spend on um, enriching their children, on purchasing good music lessons, chess lessons, soccer coaching, good summer camps for their kids. And as you can see in the 1970s, the wealthy were spending three times as much as the poor. And by the time we get to a more recent period, they're spending almost seven times as much. And, and, and so one of the um, ways um, that this is described by the people who write on it is that in the United States today, we have what are called, sorry, um, opportunity markets, which is, is, is to say that you can purchase opportunity for your kids that if we add together everything that is spent on a child to get them qualified to compete to attend the most selective colleges and universities in the United States that that is probably around 260,000 a quarter of a million dollars per child just to get them in. Um, I, I, I like the phrase opportunity market. I think we might also use the phrase merit market. And obviously that would have to be quite ironic. We like this idea that our educational system rewards merit, that, that, that it's promoting smart kids according to their intelligence. It turns out that what we regard as merit can be and is being purchased. And 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 so I'll just show you this very quickly. Uh, excuse the, the somewhat glib title, but the, the, the basic idea, right, is that if you compare the bottom 25% and the top 25% in terms of the likelihood that their children are going to graduate from college, and you compare those with the highest test scores from the bottom 25% with those with the worst test scores from the top 25%, those with the worst test scores actually have a higher chance of graduating from college than those with the best test scores who are poor, right? And, and, and again, I think this just puts the lie to the idea that the way in which opportunity is distributed in the United States in the 21st century is somehow responsive to merit. It, it's, it's much more about purchasing the qualifications that get the child into college. I am emphasizing, right, the idea that a more unequal society is a society with less equal opportunity less social mobility, and therefore less of a sense of fairness and justice, right? My Orozco image of justice, dr right? Uh, drunkenly dancing her blindfold, half uh, pulled off blood on her gown is meant to convey the sense that this highly unequal economy that we have is understood by most people and it is also being a highly unjust, highly unfair economy. And, and what I want to ask for a moment is what the cultural consequences of living in a more unfair economy are. And, and so I'm going to build for a moment on David Leonhardt's work. He, he may be familiar to some of you. He is a very well-regarded New York Times journalist and columnist. He's the chief economic reporter for the New York Times. He won a Pulitzer Prize, I think, about a decade ago. And he has a new book out, relatively new, a, a few months old, Ours with a Shining Future, which is a, a line from the book that first coined the phrase, the American dream. And, and it is the story of the American dream, but really it is a requiem for the American dream. It, it is an indication that in the middle of the 20th century, it made sense to believe that if you were born to poor parents, but you worked hard, you had a little bit of luck, you put enough effort in, you could rise, you could become middle class, and then you could anticipate that your children, through hard work and luck, 
would also rise. And, and so the idea that the United States was a place that didn't simply distribute advantages to those already advantaged, but allowed for economic mobility was central to the culture of the United States in the middle of the 20th century and was in fact empirically accurate, right? And, and, and so the diagram I showed you a few minutes ago actually comes from, sorry, Leonhardt's book, um, this, this diagram that shows you that the, the incomes at the bottom of the society were growing fastest in the middle of the 20th century. That is not the case anymore. And what I think Leonhardt does very well is to draw out the implications for the civil and political culture of a society when it has a credible sense of mobility and fairness in its economy and when it doesn't. And, and so he points the, to, to the idea in particular that in the United States in the middle of the 20th century, there was a widespread faith in the progress of our society, right? That, that, that we, not just individually, could move up, but that we as a society were making things better generation after generation for all of us. And, and that that infuses the spirit or the ethos of a society with a kind of generosity, generosity to fellow citizens, right? The, 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 the willingness to say, I'm not just gonna try to get what's good for my kid, I'll do what's good for all of our kids, for everyone in our society, and to be as clear as possible, right? There were limitations on that generosity and solidarity. There were clear lines of race demarcating who we had sympathy for and who we didn't in the middle of the 20th century in the United States. There was a clear skew in the gendered distribution of opportunity in our society where women, if they wanted to move up, generally had to marry a better off man. They couldn't do it for themselves. As we saw a couple of weeks ago, the kind of uh, cross-class marriage that, that uh, was characteristic of the middle of the 20th century allowed women to do that, but it didn't allow them to do it through their own work. Um, a willingness to sacrifice for the future. And, and, and here I'll talk a, for a second about infrastructure, right? You know, about building ports and the interstate highway system, but also about a kind of spirit of exploration, sending a man to the moon or about supporting Europe in the aftermath of World War II with the Marshall Plan. I think we could keep going. The, the, the tremendous build out of public education in the United States in the middle of the 20th century. All of this is stuff that, that, that we did from a place of security, of sense of fairness, a sense that effort was rewarded in a fair way that allowed us to then be a little bit more secure, a little bit more generous, and by the way, produced in us confidence that our institutions work, that our representatives, our leaders, our elite were responsive to our interests, to our needs, and, and that through our vote, through our unions, through our political parties, we could make our interests felt and that our leaders would respond to them. And, and I am calling your attention again to Robert Putnam's upswing. And he is a little bit more data intensive than Leonhardt is. And, and he tries to show just very briefly to, to refresh your memory about this work, that in the middle of the 20th century, we became much more equal economically, right? So, so, so we were on an upswing uh, in terms of economic fairness, but we also became much less partisan, much more willing to collaborate uh, on shared policy goals, that our society became much more solidaristic, that we joined more organizations, whether they were labor unions or churches or PTAs or fraternal organizations, that our families were more stable, and finally that our culture was also one 
of sympathy and compassion and celebration of the common man or common person, and that all of these things go together. And, and so one of the claims that Leonhardt is making is that the death of the American dream, the decline of mobility and the inequality that gives the rich the resources with which to purchase privilege for their kids to pass their hyper wealthy position on across generations is undermining our faith in our society, our sense of commonality, the ethos of solidarity of America and the 21st century. And again, my, my underlying point, not to lose the forest of the trees in, in these talks is that we need to pay attention, not just to the number, how much did the economy grow in the years that Joe Biden was president? How much did it grow? Donald Trump was president. How many jobs were created? What was the return on stocks and the level of the Dow Jones? We need to be paying attention much more to the human effects of different economic outcomes. And those effects are not just on the lifespan of our workers and our fellow citizens or our well being. It's also on our culture and that our culture has been eroded by the sense of competition, unfairness. What we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the commodification or marketization of everything, the crassness with which we now display our wealth. All of this is undermining the culture that sustained American democracy and society in the middle of the 20th century. To, to not put too fine a point on it, we've, we've talked about this before, right? The idea that on issues where the top 10% of our society's policy positions differ from those of the rest of us, the views of the 90% don't matter for the way in which our politicians vote. They are responsive almost exclusively to the top 10% or to organized interest groups to lobbyists. And, and that we understand this to reflect the fact that American elections in the aftermath of Citizens United and the kindred decisions that have opened the floodgates for money and especially dark money, uh, independent spending, super PAC spending has vastly increased the cost of running for office in the United States, right? And as you can see, we're upwards of two and a half billion dollars in 2016. There are many people who think it will be as much as a trillion dollars in 2024 and that a substantial portion, 40% of that money is coming from 0.01% of the population. So if you wanna understand why the politicians respond to the economic elite and the organized corporate interests, you don't have to go far for the explanation. And I think if you take these diagrams together, the sense that we really are no longer a democracy. Fortunately, on some issues, the preferences of average citizens coincide with the preferences of economic elites. That gives us at least the appearance of some responsiveness. But, but the, the fact that electioneering has become so expensive, wealth has become so concentrated, that the floodgates are open for wealth translating into political power makes our society increasingly oligarchic. Again, this is what wealth and inequality and immobility are doing to us. One obvious indication of, 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 of how this plays out then is to look at taxation policy. And I wanna be careful here. Our taxes are still progressive. And by the way, that group that makes so much of the income in our society, the top 1%, the top 10%, do pay the bulk of taxes that fund our federal government, but they pay much less 
than they used to. And, and so as you can see two different ways of looking at this, right? The first is, is to see that comparing 2018 with 1950, the high income group was paying more of the tax burden, the low income group less in uh, the 1950s than in 2018. We compare it with what the high income group is paying and obviously they're paying much less in 2018 and the low uh, income group is paying more. You can see that here. I know it's a little hard to make out, but the bottom 50% has seen their taxes go up. The next 40% has seen their taxes go up, right? So the bottom 90% of society is paying more in tax, the top 10% less, and the further up the top 10% you get, the more taxes have been reduced over the last 40 years. And the result is, right, if you compare the tax being paid by people in the bottom 50% with the taxes being paid by people in the top 10 or 1%, they're paying less proportionately to their income. Our income system has, income tax system has become regressive over the last 40 years. I think that is directly related to the fact that our politicians are more responsive to those with the wealth to fund our very expensive election system than they are to ordinary Americans. So with all of that in mind, I, 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 I want to pivot. And I, I have asserted that a more unequal society is a less happy society, has less well-being, has less economic uh, fairness, but even more importantly, has greater health problems, has greater social problems. And, and, and we've, we've talked about this together before. I'll be relatively brief in, in reintroducing you to the ideas, in particular of Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. And they are both British public health researchers. And, and, and you, you may say, wait a sec, I thought we were talking about economics. Why are we now transitioning to public health researchers? Shouldn't we be looking at economists or sociologists or at least political scientists? And, and so this leads me to give a little bit of the backstory. And Richard Wilkinson in particular did some really important research in the late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, what's called the Whitehall studies, which were about civil servants in uh, London. And the backstory is, is that Wilkinson, a epidemiologist, became interested in the following question. In Britain, in the second half of the 20th century, thanks to antibiotics, vaccination, sanitation, better public health policies, including uh, national health services, people were not dying nearly to the degree that they had for most of human history from contagious diseases. What was killing them instead? And, and, and so the number one cause of death now was heart disease. What causes heart disease? And, and, and that's where Wilkinson really began his career. And the conclusion he reached, this famous study, is that really the most important pathogen, the most important source of heart disease is stress and not occasional acute stress, but long-term chronic stress. And, and so he designed studies that measured the level of stress associated with work and then correlated that with the susceptibility to heart disease. And then slowly over time, he and other researchers identified that part of what stress does is change the body's chemistry, in particular, the hormones that we secrete, that we tend to produce more cortisol in particular, which is a stress hormone. When we are experiencing stress, that that's valuable to us if the stressful situation is one that requires us to be alert and fast and have 
quick muscle reflex reaction times, but not good for us if the stress is chronic sustained stress and that the high levels of cortisol actually damage our bodies over time. And this then set him and, and eventually his colleague, Kate Pickett, down this research path. And, and they've now written two books on this, The Spirit Level about a decade ago, The Inner Level about five years ago. They've got a major research hub that they organize with a bunch of people who work on these issues. And the conclusion, the striking conclusion to their research is if we want people to live longer, to be healthier, to be less susceptible to many of the diseases that are now the chief causes of mortality in affluent societies, the best thing we can do is to reduce the level of stress in our society. And then the work of Claude Steele, an American social psychologist spent much of his career at Stanford, spent some time at Columbia, is at UC Berkeley in the provost's office now. And um, Steele's work is very different on its face from the work of Wilkinson and Pickett. Steele was really interested in test score gaps or disparities by race in the United States. And, and, and I'm sure this is a familiar finding that African-American children who are apparently as intelligent and educated as white children, nevertheless do worse on standardized tests. And, and so Steele sought to explain this and through a variety of innovative experiments, identified what he calls stereotype or social evaluative threat as being extremely important to the test gap, the test score gap. Um, and that in particular, something very similar to what Wilkinson and Pickett discovered was going on in America with regards to race, which is that African Americans knew that there was a stereotype of them in our society. And that in high stress, high stakes contexts in which there is a negative stereotype of you that is relevant to your performance in that context, the presence of the stereotype tends to activate a stress response and that that produces cortisol, a fight or flight reaction, and that's just not good for higher order cognitive tasks to be in a fight or flight state. And, and so now to, to pull these together for a moment, what Wilkinson and Pickett did with the work of social psychologists like Claude Steele is to further develop their thesis and suggest that the most unequal societies have the highest levels of social evaluative stress, not based on race, but based on class and status differences. And so a, a few weeks ago, when I was out there with you in person, we, we, we looked at this diagram. And, and this is the result of their research of building this complex explanatory model, and then looking for the correlations to support their hypothesis, which is that more unequal societies will have higher levels of health and social problems. The index, you may remember, combines a whole bunch of ways of measuring health and social problems, life expectancy, math and literacy, children's test scores, infant mortality, the murder rate, the imprisonment rate, the rate of teenage births. How much trust is there in society? What's the level of obesity in the society? What's the level of mental illness? And finally, something we've already talked about, how much social mobility is there in the society? And as you can see, the more equal societies score better in all of those regards. They are healthier and 
greater well-being societies than are the more unequal societies. And, and, and using these metrics, America comes out as having both the highest level of inequality and the lowest level of health, the highest level of social problems, right? And, and this, to be clear, I think, again, we talked about this for a moment, does not seem to be correlated with wealth at all, right? Wealthier societies, some of them are doing much worse. Some of them are doing much better. Poor societies, well, some of them are actually doing much better. Some of them are doing much worse. But if you tried to put a line through this, if you tried to organize a causal effect between wealth and health and social problems, there is no direct correlation, right? Whereas the relationship between inequality and social well-being is absolutely clear. Um, there are a, a, a number of variables we could break down here. And, and I, I know that there's a lot of going on on this chart. Um, I, I want you to, to see, first of all, that the United States is the orange dot, right? And, and so it's much more unequal than the other societies, Sweden, Japan, Germany, France, and the United Kingdom uh, being compared. And it is not the worst in terms of social mobility, but it, it, it's quite bad. It is by far and away the worst in terms of life expectancy, right? You know, four years less than the next worst country. Uh, it's doing bad in terms of teenage pregnancy. Most of the other countries are much better. Uh, it's doing worse in terms of obesity. And, and, and we can talk more about this, but, but the idea of hedonic eating, that, that people who are not feeling that their life is going well often eat to compensate for that, much worse in terms of infant mortality. And, and look, we, we, we can start by noticing that all these other societies have universal national health insurance for everyone in their society. And so maybe there's something independent going on here. But having said that, the, the, the fact that perhaps there's lower solidarity, lower trust in the United States makes it harder for us to get universal health insurance. The murder rate in the United States, three times as high as all of these other societies. The imprisonment, five times as high, right? And then we can see the poverty rate is higher. Uh, income difficulties are higher. Voting rates are lower. Trust is much lower, right? And, and so I hope you're beginning to get a picture of, of, of what I'm suggesting in a much more concrete way, which is if we care about how economic results translate into human life and the quality of that life. We have to change the way we talk about economic policy. We're not going to benefit in the 21st century just from pursuing growth, just from pursuing job creation, just by looking at the stock market or productivity or GDP. These numerical surrogates for economic health don't translate into the well-being of the majority of our population. A large part of that has to do with the fact that in order to secure economic growth, higher productivity, stock market gains in the 21st century, we necessarily encounter greater inequality and inequality has all of these additional effects that are bad for us as a society. Let me stop there. I, I'm, I'm close to having built my entire argument and now we can start talking about, well, what should we be doing if we change the metric? That will be where we'll go in the coming weeks. Happy to take any questions or comments you have either about the discussion of inequality and its effects on us or about the stuff we started the class with what's happening in Russia and what's happening with uh, the American debate.
domestic political scene. Who wants to start us out today? David, I don't have a, a real specific question, but why is it I always feel down at the end of every lecture? <laughs> 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 I think you need to up the Prozac dose, Anne. Um, I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah, no, I, I will confess that that with rare exceptions, I think of my job as being to talk about how we can improve, and that involves having to illuminate what we're doing poorly, right? And yes. by the way, I am building to there are good policies and they're actually very affordable. I, I'm reading, among other things, um, Matthew Desmond's new book, Poverty by America. And he points out that we could eliminate poverty in America through income transfer programs that could be funded by reducing tax evasion by a quarter, right? We lose roughly a trillion dollars a year to tax evasion. If we transferred roughly $177 billion a year to poor people, poverty would be gone in the United States. And, and so one way to, to, to think about the upshot of all of this is I'm actually trying to go someplace positive. I'm trying to get us to the place where, where we've got a really <laughs> strong argument to say, look, all of this rubbish about you know transfer programs reducing the incentives for the entrepreneurs in our midst to do the things that are good for us all doesn't hold up in the 21st century and that actually what we could do to make things better for all of us is relatively simple, relatively affordable, and clearly beneficial. And 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 so I I, I appreciate that that you're saying you know that this is not good news. And and that's because we've been on a on a bad path as a society for 50, mm -hmm. 70 years. I do think part of the reason that not just us, but so many societies across the democratic world are seeing an increase in right-wing populist authoritarian tendencies is because people are fed up with the path we're on. Part of what's incumbent upon us then is to identify a better path, a better set of policies. Thank you, Ann. David, go ahead. Yeah, well, there's so many issues um, to deal with. Uh, uh, the, apropos of what you just said, though, I Bet if we dig deeper, we'll find that this um, uh, increasing inequality is the root of a lot of our problems uh, with the maldistribution of educational opportunity, which you documented, but also health care and, and, uh, and many others. Uh, but I, that's not really what my question is about. My question is about a kind of a, a very small thing that you mentioned, but I've never quite understood. And what we said is that since Citizens United and since the creation of these dark this dark money that funds campaigns and the like uh then that, that campaigns can really be bought uh, you know you, you can buy elections and the question is I'm trying to figure out who benefits from that who gets that money as near as i can tell it must be both local and national network tv who benefits because they pay for spots on tv and do they pay for space on social media like facebook and Instagram and the like. And I'm just trying to figure out the flow of the money and how it is that this thing gets held up. So there must be that the people who benefit financially and this, the uh, businesses that benefit financially really like this model. Uh, and I just don't know who those people are. Uh, I guess I, I guess people who, who, uh, who uh, uh, produce junk mail must like it because we certainly get our fair share of that. Uh, but but that would be interesting to me someday is to trace out where that money that allegedly wins elections with, um, uh, you know, on the dark side, where it where it goes. I know where it comes from. It comes from these packs that have been created. 
uh, so there's that. And the final thing I want to say is that in the last week, I probably read five or six columns by, uh, you know, a left-leaning uh, columnist whose whose opinions I respect, saying, uh, "Joe, it's time to go." Uh, that you, that, uh, and the latest one I read uh, said that uh, Joe but Biden couldn't have picked a more ironic opportunity to demonstrate uh, his uh, cognitive uh, 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 faux pas than trying to uh, uh, speak back to the report uh, that was done about his fitness and the like. And that it, 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 that was not only negative, it was ironic because he was he was going to stand up to it and, and simply in the process demonstrated that he, he does have these cognitive gaps that we, are, we all worry about. Yeah, That's and, and I, I'm going to uh, talk mainly to the first point. And, and, and so two ways to think about all this money being spent on our politics. Um, Jane Mayer in, in her book, oh. Dark Money, points out that people like the Kochs, the, you know, people who are the, the Koch brothers spending, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars financing a network of very rich donors to purchase influence on American politics, they're not stupid, right? They're accomplished business people. They do do a lot of data analysis. So in a sense, who profits is precisely the people spending the money. They're calculating their return. The return is from lower corporate tax rates from lower inheritance taxation from lower income taxation and so i think in a sense the way i i would reframe your question david is is that it's not that the television industries or let's you know notice the campaign workers when when, when i was a campaign worker we were happy if we got every other paycheck because we knew that our uh, campaign was underfunded and that they were going to put their money elsewhere. It's now the case that, that that there's a huge industry in the United States of running campaigns, right? And and that you can make a lot of money just being a political consultant in the United States today. Um, I would also note, yes, that that it's not just uh, television media, and 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 we just had an election in New York. Obviously, you know, if you're looking at the balance of power in the House of Representatives and you're a fan of the Democrats, you're happy with the outcome of it. But we were saturated in our local television with advertisement, advertisement, advertisement for these two candidates, you know, and, and they can't get it targeted enough. I don't live in the district that got to vote. But having said that, I saw 100 uh, commercials in the few hours I watched TV over the couple weeks building up to the election um and and then let us not forget social media right because social media is so influential these days and please note that this is not just campaign advertisements right this is so-called social media influencers who can be paid to produce spots that appear to be spontaneous voluntary ordinary person just reflecting on Joe Biden for, you know, confusing Egypt with Mexico and not even, you know, reaching some sort of judgment, just ridiculing him, right? It turns out that there's money to be made in doing that too. So, so yes, I'm not familiar with the study that traces where all the money goes. Uh, you know, some of it is more mundane stuff, like ground game, like, you know, how do you get the people to the polls? Some of it is paying people to challenge people at the polls, right? So, so I suspect it would be complicated. Uh, I imagine somebody's done the study, but I'm not at all clear. Um, the Biden must go stuff. Um, there's there, there's a column I, I I read about all of those columns by by. Uh, let me see if I can find her name. But the woman who used to be the person who who wrote for the New York Times about uh, the the coverage of the New York Times of political issues and and she 
um, wrote for them during the 2016 campaign and was very critical of the coverage of Clinton's um, uh, email, right? And, and how much coverage that got. This woman's name is Margaret Sullivan, by the way. She, she no longer works for the Times. She has her own subtack. And, and she points out, look, the um, outcome of the 2024 campaign, we don't know what it's going to be. We don't know how it's going to be decided. But if you look at the coverage in the mainstream media of Joe Biden's memory and age, it looks an awful lot like the coverage of Hillary Clinton's emails. And we have to wonder whether Joe Biden's age is any more consequential than Hillary Clinton's emails. And, and I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of research into this. It appears that the majority of people who've worked with Donald Trump believe that he does not have the mental acuity to be the president of the United States, right? That he, for instance, that the, the, the NATO leadership knew that when you met with Donald Trump, you had to keep your points to around two to three minutes because that was the extent of his attention span, that he basically stopped taking the national security briefing because he was bored with it, that the people who advised him had to figure out how to make the point graphic because he couldn't process information any other way. And, and so at some level, we've got to ask, you know, how much of this is just the pageantry of politics, the quote, low arts by which elections are won, as James Madison captured it 220 odd years ago, right? You know, the, the, this is a real issue? I'm not sure. Or is this just optics? Is it just, yes, Joe Biden is 81 years old. I would prefer that somebody younger and more dynamic and more charismatic, but also somebody perhaps who was more attuned to the concerns of younger generations were our, what was our candidate for president. But as I said at the very beginning, right, the liabilities of Joe Biden compared with the liabilities of Donald Trump, even if we're comparing apples and apples, who has the mental acuity to be president? Most of the people who work with Joe Biden say he's very sharp, that he's understood the issues he's dealing with and that he's made good decisions and been effective as a diplomat, as a leader, as somebody brokering policy decisions, right? How does he get that across? I don't know. But but that the Joe must go literature, I think, is buying into a media feeding frenzy on an issue that the media owes us deeper and more accurate reporting on. And, and, and so I, I, I do want to push back on, on that a little bit. It doesn't mean that I'm a, you know, uh, gonna, gonna uh, pretend that this is not an issue, but I think there's an issue about this issue that we really should be talking about. Make sense? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I, I still have the issue of these people whose views I respect and who I don't think are part of this, you know, frenzy uh, uh, making these uh, Joe Musco statements. But but that's for another day. One final th point, and that is an historical one. And that, that is you mentioned that you think that the sort of the myth of the uh, of the uh, enlightened entrepreneur uh, no longer holds the way it did. Uh, and I think some historians would question whether it was ever uh, beneficial to anyone other than those entrepreneurs and maybe uh, their um, uh, their relatives and and, um, and offspring. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, just a, a, a historical possibility. Yeah, no, I mean, certainly the rate of economic growth in the United States was higher when our rate of redistributive taxation was higher. Right. And, and, and so that does suggest that, that at least it's possible to have robust economic growth and um, also 
high levels of redistributive taxation. My argument, I think, is a little bit more radical than that, which is, is, is frankly, we should begin really looking critically at whether or not we need high levels of economic growth anymore. And, and you know, there's an environmental argument to be made to, to say, you know, look, um, the, the, the cost of the growth is going to be to future generations and the habitability of the planet. But there's also a humanitarian argument to be made or a utilitarian argument to be made. If we want what's best for the majority of the people in the United States, it looks like in the 21st century, just getting high levels of economic growth doesn't cut it anymore, if it ever did. All right. I think that's a good place to leave off. Wonderful being with you guys, as always. Uh, you guys be well, take care, and I look forward to continuing the conversation next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you.